Did you guys feel something happening during that time there? Well, I hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to start a series, uh, just a short one, called Cultural Moment. Uh, the idea is we're going to take some time to determine, somehow define the culture that we're living in and the culture that we're moving toward. As well as looking at some key responses of the church needs to embody and live out uh, in order to see God's kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven, which is our prayer, right? Ultimately for us here in Holly Springs to see God's kingdom come here in Holly Springs as it is in heaven. And to do this, I I need to take the majority of my time today really helping uh, explain what I will call this cultural moment and, and how we got here. Uh, And so I'm going to be talking a lot about history, and I'm going to be talking a lot about shifts that have happened in culture over time and things like that, and and the way the church has chosen to respond up until now and how we must respond moving forward. And and so let's let's just dive right in, okay, because this is, is, I'm I'm, I'm going to, I've I've taken about 30 or 40 pages of notes in my study to try and do this series, and, uh, and I'm trying to consolidate them down to something that's like digestible on a Sunday morning. So, um, so forgive me, but we're going we're gonna to go for it, all right? Uh, so the first, um, the first thing we have to understand is there have been three moves in culture over history. Uh, there is the pre-Christian culture. This is a uh, uh, before any understanding of Christ kind of culture. And there are a few cultures still in the world that, that live in and have this. The most of them are in the eastern hemisphere of the world, uh, but there are still a few around there is also then the, the Christian culture or the Christianized culture, uh, which comes after the resurrection of Jesus, uh, started by the early church and became prominent really in the fourth century when Rome elected to make Christianity the, the religion of the Roman Empire. Uh, and that's where for much of uh, like history from that point forward, uh, people started to shape and form their moral ethic and moral compass of society around things that Jesus was about. Things like finding out and, and building out programs for the poor. Things like trying to find a way to elevate women, and we still have a long way to go in both of those areas, and really all of these areas, um, and, then, and then the coming together of different people groups from different uh, nationalities and places and languages and tongues and different races, and, and this is something that starts to shape the modern world, and, then, uh, and now we have what we would consider a post-Christian culture. And this is a culture that is formed in reaction against authority. That's really the, the idea behind post-Christian culture. Some people call it post-modern culture, but we use the term post-Christian for today. And uh, it's, it's a rail against all authority, but that includes the Bible and Christ, uh, while simultaneously trying to hold on to the values that, that Christianity has brought into the world. Uh, the things that, the things that uh, Christianity has brought that are really beautiful and good, um, and yet it's an attempt, what Mark Sears says, is an attempt to have the kingdom without the king. And so the term post-Christian was first recognized in the 18th century in Australia, but honestly, we haven't started using that term a whole lot in around our world, especially here in the southern United States, um, and except for the last 20 years or so. But this is post-Christianity's promise. Post-Christianity's promise was that it would uh, be able to deliver a life where you could live out and everyone can live in their own free will and desires. And with that comes a post-Christian world that is bent on deconstruction. Think about uh, 1970s rock and roll, all right? Think about that. Think about the edgy turn in television and film. Think about the sexual revolution. Now, you push forward about 30 years, and there's a guy named Bill Clinton who gets elected into office, and I'm not making a political statement about Bill Clinton or anyone else for that matter, um, but, but what we began to see with his... Um, inauguration was that there became this huge political divide in the political system unlike ever before at least in America had ever seen and so um, and we have to also understand that post-christian culture post-christianity is both on the left and on the right 
You think uh, about the left, and it desires things like social justice and equality. These are flagship marks of the kingdom of God as well. And they're beautiful things that our culture and our society uh, fights for and desires to have and experience. But they're kingdom things. And yet what they're trying to do is they're trying to achieve this equality. They're trying to achieve this justice without Jesus or without the Bible being the authority behind what they're doing. On the right, there is this desire to uphold a traditional view of marriage and keep babies from being killed, which many of us can get behind because I think that aligns in our our large marks of the kingdom of God, beautiful marks of the kingdom of God. And yet the leaders on the right, they've been married multiple times. They sleep around. And the sanctity of marriage really isn't as important as just making sure that sex happens between a man and a woman. And they are also a part of this system where they try and create a utopian nationalism that is built on capitalist system, literally, that makes its money off the backs of slaves all over the world. Something that Jesus would not be for. So both sides want the kingdom without the king. But as the shift and divide in politics has taken place, what we've also seen is the majority position, at least in pop culture, has also changed. Our, in our lifetime, the, the predominant... Um, shift in in pop culture has had shifted to being a predominantly uh, leftist view from what was previously a more conservative view. Now you have those on the left who are trying to hold on to this position, this majority position, and they're trying to defend it, while those on the right are trying to seize control, and it really just creates a really big mess. And the funny thing is, is that they aren't much different. They aren't much different, at least not in the way they live their lives. Like you took an intern from MSNBC, which is the far left view, and an intern from Fox News, which is the far right view, uh, and you put them in a room together and let them have a conversation. They would fight all night long about their opinions. But then you let them out of that room and you follow them around with a camera. They're going to live their lives almost identically. And they're both going to be just as equally susceptible to dealing with struggles of fear and anxiety and addiction, especially to technology and so forth and so on. So they're both railing against one another while simultaneously reaping the benefits of a system built on democracy. And they both are hell-bent on deregulation, the left deregulation of all authority and on the right deregulation of the market. Like I said, it's a mess. Now, these massive shifts start to take place in the 1970s in America and really all over the West. And this shift is a huge, huge ramifications on the Church of Jesus Christ. In the 1930s in England, there was a young man named Leslie Newbegin who decided he wanted to be a missionary in India. And so Newbegin uh, was leaving a Christian culture in England and headed to a pre-Christian culture in India. And he was working with people who had no understanding of Jesus, no understanding of the Bible, and no understanding of the way in which Jesus' way of life invades and, and impacts all aspects of society. So he left England in the 1930s, and he moved to India, and he shared the gospel and did great there. It was amazing, amazing ministry that he led and that he had for nearly 45 years. And then in 1974, he returned to England, and when he returned, he immediately saw the world that he left in the 1930s is not the world that he once called home. Now, this is right at the height of the rise of rock and roll culture and like the rejection of political correctness. I mean, think you had the Sex Pistols on national television like getting kicked off because they just cho- chose to use profanity. You, you think about the sexual revolution that was beginning to happen. You think about Woodstock and all of these things. This is when he heads back into England and he begins to see something uh, truly, truly startling. He realized that England needed missionaries a lot like India needed missionaries. And so uh, how, India, however, was a much different place. It was an unreached people. It was completely devoid of understanding anything about Christ or anything about the way of Jesus. And England, however, was a huge, huge, like, key place in the Protestant Reformation. So you have these, you have these, you have these like, groups uh, where, where Newbegin leaves, and he leaves a Christian culture, goes to a non-Christian culture, and then comes back to a post-Christian culture. And what New began and so many others began to do is they tried to start reaching that post-Christian culture with the gospel. And this church started to take on different forms. Less traditional forms because obviously this culture rails against tradition, right? This post-Christian culture rails against authority. So they, they did everything differently. And this is what we get uh, is termed the missional movement. 
of the church. Are you guys familiar with that terminology? Maybe you're not. I don't know. But, um, but if you don't know, uh, that's, a, that's a period of time in which the church began to shift and move to try and be more missional to reach this post-Christian culture. Now, the missional movement was beautiful in its intention, right? It's a desire to teach people who are leaving the church in droves. I mean, people were just leaving the church so fast uh, during this time. And um, that, that uh, especially when they, would, when they would get out of their parents' home and be on their own and be able to have their own authority and make their own decisions, and we kind of continue to see that. What we saw early on was that people that would do that, they would eventually come back, and now we don't see that anymore. That's a shift that we're starting to see in culture take place now is that when people leave their house that they grew up in, whether Christian or not, they, they oftentimes leave the church altogether never to be seen through its doors ever again. Now, this movement um, came with significant problems, although it, it was fairly successful in a lot of ways. I mean, there was a rise of mega churches all over the world and all over the country. Uh, it was an attempt to really be accepted by culture, to be relevant, to be vulnerable, uh, and, um, and all of those kinds of things. Um, but at the same time, it left the church very, very vulnerable to colonization by the culture. And the churches were being planted with taglines like church for people who hate church, which isn't even biblical because the Bible says that you can't hate the church and love Jesus, okay? So, like, that's not even a biblical thing, so I don't, I don't know why that was happening, but it was happening, trying to reach the culture. And, and so um, what started to happen is you started to be seeing, like, like these churches that are stooped in this missional movement beginning to look more and more like the secular world. And their worship service became more like concerts, and their functionality became more business-like, and so forth and so on. And not all of that is inherently bad. But this desire to be relevant and sometimes even cool, <laughs> it was a big voice that the church was proclaiming from about 1989 to about 2008. And it was pretty effective in some cases with boomers and Gen, Gen X people, um, but it has failed to be very very formative for those millennials and Gen Zs. Think DC talk of the 90s, you know, if you grew up in church. I'm down with the DC talk, okay? <laughs> duh, duh, down with the DC talk. You know, Jesus is still all right with me, you know? Um, now, if you grew up in churches, right, like this, you, you, you and I all probably grew up in churches a lot like this in a lot of ways. Because churches that didn't adopt some sort of missional mindset, honestly, were dying fast. And those that did, they were growing, but they were growing a lot in width and not necessarily in depth. And what began to happen is the cultural situations and the cultural moment that was arising in our world left the people who were a part of the church incapable of dealing with the changes. Now, I want you to think about it. Think about a world that's politically divided, where the moral ethic shift has taken place, where a predominant worldview changes, where there's a rise in globalization and digital capitalization and the digital age in general, and, and with a church simultaneously saying, go out into the world, be on mission, win back America and the West for Jesus. This was very, very ineffective in a lot of ways. Because you get a church that ultimately ends up looking a lot more like culture than a culture that looks like the church. And this is why disc, like de deconstruction is such a huge thing in the churches in our world today. Right? Post-Christian world is bent on this deconstruction. And there's this idea that this, there, there, there are countless stories, countless stories that have happened, especially in, in like the last... 20 years, 10, 15 years um, of millennials and Gen Zs who are deconstructing their faith as a childhood because they look at church and all they can say is, well, it's just really attractive or it's really edgy or it's not deep enough. And they begin to break down that like, oh, there's a deeper way of living life and it's not in the church. And then there's also this like trend that took place right at the time that I was graduating college in about 2010, started hearing about these things called missional communities. 
right, which were basically, think, small groups that were, like, equipped to go out into a community and on, be on mission for Jesus, try and win people to the church. And, and, and even that was fairly ineffective because what we ended up seeing is that just as many people that were won to the church in that scenario or through that methodology, there were just as many lost to deconstruction while trying to reach that culture. And all too often, this deconstruction of Christianity is due to the fact, it's due to the fact that there is, this, there is this growing perception that society or that culture is actually more moral than Christians because society and culture is more loving and accepting than Christians. And so the argument that you are trying to make or that we are trying to make oftentimes is like, don't you see that what you're doing is immoral? And they're saying, don't you see that what you're doing is more immoral than what I'm doing? And so it's just this really, really messed up worldview that we're having to deal with. But the answer to the problem, I'm just going to be honest with you guys, is not to run and hide. It's not to protect your kids from the world either. It won't work. Your, your, kids, your kids don't know anything of a Christian culture. They don't know it. All they know is a post-Christian culture. If you try and raise your kids and you're overly, overly oppressive and you don't let them figure out how to navigate the culture, my guess is just like the culture teaches them to, they will rail against that authority. And so we can't think that culture, like here in the South, is even going to maintain uh, a high view of the church, because I don't really think it already does. I think that's just already kind of started to take place. But there's also, but if culture, cultural Christianity isn't dead yet, it will be dead in our lifetime. I promise you that. And the reality is, is that when uh, people, people are going to stop coming to church just because it's a habit or just because it's what they do on Sunday morning. I have to realize this. Now, if that scares you a little, if that causes you a little a bit of anxiety and a little bit of angst, because it does me, let me share something with you. All right? Flip over to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Paul is writing, and he is... So good at drawing our attention to the hope we have in Christ. And that's what he does here. Look at this. Philippians 1 verse 27. He says, whatever happens. I love that. I love that it starts with whatever happens. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together in, as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. Listen, I find so much hope in this passage. It truly inspires me. Like it's, it, it is inspiring because what Paul is saying is that there is a coming judgment. That judgment is coming on this world. It is going to come on this culture. And in, but, but in the midst of that, in the midst of that, a mark worthy of the gospel is one that is not afraid. He says, don't be afraid of whatever happens to you. This is a mark worthy of the gospel. Why is it a mark of, the, like, of a life lived worthy of the gospel? Because your hope is in Christ and only in Christ. And so whatever happens, I'm good. Because I've been saved, because I've been redeemed by Christ and his blood. Whatever happens. And so many of us, so many of us are afraid. We're trying to run and hide. When a culture can see the church, the people of God, not afraid of how the end will turn out because they have their hope truly set in Christ, and they live their life in accordance with Christ, obedient to his teachings, full of faith, 
that he has redeemed them and that, he will, they, that they will be with him in glory. That is a mark that shows our world that we are saved. So if, and this is a big if, all right? But if our hope is truly in him, we don't have anything to fear. We don't have anything to fear. We don't have to live fear of the present. But we can live knowing that for us to live is Christ. And to even die would be gain. Now, this passage does say, however, that those who don't hope in Christ, which will include people in the church and outside alike, those who put their hope in ideologies, those who put their hope in the world, who put their hope in a political system or a political party or a political regime, it will be a sign of their destruction. Now, the truth is, that what our culture has been striving for is autonomy and freedom, right? And what they don't realize is that what has only happened as they have grasped for that autonomy and freedom, and in a lot of cases found it for themselves, it has only brought more bondage. Because our world is more riddled than ever before with mental illness, anxiety, depression, and things like that. NPR recently did a study back in 2015, that said children from the ages 5 to 17 years old are two times more likely to commit suicide. Um, and that study was done from, from people in 2008 to 2015. So just in a seven-year kind of time span, that seven-year time span, it went up drastically to the number of children who are going to be willing to commit suicide. We're almost a decade since that study. I can only imagine what those numbers might be today. But I'm imagining it's probably three or four times, um, not just two times. Not to mention the fact that, like, uh, if, do, you guys, do you guys know, like, th that study uh, kind of gauged a change from 2008 to 2015. Do you know what changed in our world in 2007? The iPhone. The iPhone came about. And people were no longer uh, connecting via phone call or um, even text message or even uh, AOL instant messenger or email. People started connecting through social media. And uh, I want to read something because this, is just, this was just fascinating to me when I read it. And I want to read something to you from uh, a person who's worked in the tech field um, and has invented like a pretty incredible piece of tech that our world loves and buys into greatly. Um, his name is Jason Lanier, and uh, he is the inventor of virtual reality. He works as a, uh, as a researcher for Microsoft, so he's in Silicon Valley, he's in the engine, right? He's doing the thing. And this is what he says in his book, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Account Right Now, all right? Um, he says, social media is a continuous behavior modification on a mass basis. With everyone under surveillance by their devices and receiving calculated stimulus to modify them. It is a bad religion. It is nerdy, empty, sterile, ugly, useless religion that is based on false ideas. Our world spends more time scrolling through Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, and TikTok than they do reading the scriptures of Jesus Christ. I guarantee you that that stat is true, even though I haven't fact-checked it. <laughs> and, and it is killing us. It is putting us in bondage. And the freedom and the autonomy that we have been striving for, that we've gone after, and that many think we have accomplished, isn't freedom. It isn't freedom. We are enslaved to our passions and desires unlike ever before. But in the midst of that, our culture cannot be afraid. Our church culture cannot be afraid. We cannot look to protect ourselves, to remain safe. We have to invade the world with a non-anxious presence. We have to show that nothing, we, we are afraid of nothing because we have Christ. All we have is Christ, and that's enough.
He's always enough for us. You know, um, Charles Malick, he says this. He says, we find Christ in the crisis. Anybody feel like we're in a crisis right now? And here's the beauty is that I think that's where we find Christ. That's why I have so much hope for the future. That's why I have so much hope for what's coming is because we find Christ in the crisis. You want to know why? Because when crisis comes, oftentimes it takes us to the end of ourselves. It takes us to a place where we're most weak and where we're most vulnerable. And it is true that in our weakness, Christ's power is made perfect. And if we can sense somehow, if we can come to the end of ourselves and stop operating as a, as a church and as the church from a place of strength, but start operating from a place of weakness and desperation where all our hope is in Christ, then I believe God can spark revival in our world. I really believe that. Because many people believe that there is this downward descent into secularism, but that's like all the great awakenings are over. And, and I just, I don't believe that's true. One, because history doesn't say that. What history would actually look like if you tracked like the trajectory of Christianity in the world, it looked like a bell curve. It goes up and down. Because there are always moments where the church realized, man, we are at the end of ourselves. And what we need is more of the Spirit. What we need is more of God, not more programs, not more systems, not more processes, not to be more business-like, but to be more faithful, to be devoted to one another and be devoted to the Word, to be devoted to prayer on our knees before God. This is the call. I love what um, Pete Hughes, pastor of KXC Church in London, says. He says, this is a threshold moment. And I love this. He, uh, he had a staff member who wrote this, and I want to share it with you. I don't know their name. I just know that they work on staff with Pete at KXC. And uh, KXC is doing great things in one of the most po postmodern cities in our world in England, but he says this. Threshold moments are equally beautiful and terrifying. They have the capacity to make or break the vision. As you stand on the cusp of everything you've ever hoped for and surveyed the land that now lies before you, your eyes tracing the intricate shapes that settle on the horizon, too good to imagine. This is what has been stirring for so long. This has been the cry of your heart for years, hidden deep down, but now it's here. The first glimpse of the dream turned reality, within reach, right before your very eyes, so nearly there. And as you stand there on the threshold of everything you've dreamed about, and with a cocktail of excitement and fear rising in equal measure, the other voice kicks in, the one that gently tells you to take a step back from the threshold. It whispers to you that passing through that door will have its cost. That it's good. That it's too good to be true. Even worse, what lies in front of you is all a mirage and you'd be foolish to walk through that door. It will disappear as soon as you enter. It is better to survey the land from the doorway, better to distance yourself from it just in case. It is better to stand at the threshold just watching, better to quietly let a dream die now before sacrifices are made, bridges are burned, and there's no safe way back. Threshold moments have power. Many see them, at the end, see them as the end of a long journey where we finally glimpse what our hearts have longed for, but they stopped exhausted and find themselves sitting in the doorway to never cross through and take hold of it. Tired and exhausted, they find contentment in the reasoning that they have made it this far. They can see from a distance, and that is good enough. But the truth is, these threshold moments are just the start of the adventure. They're only just the beginning. So step in, take courage, and move forward, for you've been called for such a time as this. Amen. You've been called for such a time as this, for this cultural moment. And we are at a threshold moment where God's kingdom is in view. And we can see it, 
and we can taste it. We can almost reach out and touch it. And what we need to realize is that we're at the end of our rope and to grasp it and to see it take hold of our world and see God spark revival in our church and in the church, we have to be at the end of ourselves. We have to get to a place where we operate from our weakness and not our strength. And so that's what we'll talk about next week. Next week, we'll look at what it means to, for the church to desperately cry out to God from a place of weakness. But for now, I want you to take heart. Take heart. Because Jesus says in John 16, he says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. That in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Take heart. Realize that we are at the brink of something great and something beautiful. The rise of the Spirit coming among us. I could feel it in the room before I got up here to speak. And it just takes us knowing that, man, we're at the end of ourselves. Let the power of God, may His, may His power be made perfect in our weakness. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for this, this life. We thank you for this church. God, we thank you for this hope that we have in you. God, we thank you that you have come, that you have died and set us free, that you've redeemed us, that you've washed away our sins, that you've taken away our shame, our guilt. And God, we pray that we see that all our hope is in you. Whatever happens, may we live a life worthy of the gospel that believes that truer than anything, more than anything. That you, that you might stir in our hearts that there is nothing better in this world than you. There's nothing better we can strive for and go after that's better than you. So God, may we hold tightly to you. May we cling to you. May we find hope in you. In you alone, God. God, forgive us. And may we repent of those times where we put hope in our political system more than we put our hope in you. Give, forgive us and, and, and may we repent of when we put our hope in our finances more than we put our hope in you. God, forgive us of when we put our hope in, in, in our education or understanding or, or our knowledge in, in, or our theology or anything more than we put our hope in you and your spirit coming and moving amongst your people. And may we realize that because you died, because you were raised from the dead, the same spirit that was alive in you is alive in us. And it is, a it is a spirit of power and love and self-discipline, not one of fear. And so, God, may we love with that spirit and may we be self-disciplined in that spirit. May we, we be uh, tapped into its power and may we move forward in this cultural moment to make impact in our world and, 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 and let you begin to do something great in us. But God, in order to do that, we gotta come to our end. We have to come to the end of ourselves, the end of our strength. And so God, during, during this time, as we respond, God, I just pray that you'll bring us to our knees, that you'll bring us to a place of where we just want more of you, 
I want you to pour out more of your spirit on us because we need it. We are in desperate need, God. We are crying out to you with a, with a voice and a cry of desperation that we need you. And anyone who does it, it will be proof. It will be proof of their destruction. So, God, may we cry out. May we cry out to you. You're all we have. You're our only hope. God, we love you. Thank you so much for showing us and displaying that we can trust you, that we can put our hope in you by coming and dying on the cross for our sins, saving us and redeeming us. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.